Properties of water. So water is a very important substance, right? We all know that, you know, life cannot live without water. And life really originates in water too. So water is a polar, first of all, and that's because water molecule is formed by this polar covalent bond. Remember, we have one oxygen. So this is an oxygen atom. And then we have two hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen. So I like to say that the water molecule structure really looks like the head of the Mickey Mouse, right? You have the, the head and then you have the two ears. And remember the hydrogen and oxygen, they do not share electrons equally. So this results different poles on the hydrogen and you have slightly positive charge. And on the oxygen end, you have slightly negative charge, right? Because oxygen is much stronger. So oxygen is pulling the shared electrons closer to itself. So more electron distribution on the oxygen side, right? This results to this results in a slightly negative charge on the oxygen end. There is a positive end and there's the negative end. So water molecule is very polar. And this is why water can dissolve molecules that are also polar. I right? think about salts, sugar, those molecules are very polar. So they can dissolve in water very easily. So polar molecules like other polar molecules and they can mix really well. But you cannot dissolve non polar molecules in water very easily, right? Because they're not the same type of molecules. So nonpolar molecules avoid polar molecules, including water. So nonpolar molecules like oil, like fats, they do not mix in water well. They do not dissolve in water. All right. Now, water molecules are also cohesive. So cohesion really just describes how similar molecules stick with one another. So water molecules are attracted to other water molecules. And that's because all the water molecules will have, look at here, a positive end and negative end, right? So the negative end of one water molecule is going to be attractive to the positive end of another water molecule, right? So over here, that's slightly positive. So these two ends are going to attract one another. So this kind of makes water molecules a little bit sticky to one another. And this is the reason why water can travel through small capillaries without energy, right? You put the capillaries in water and you can see water molecules will just go up that small capillaries because water molecules are sticky with one another. So they're pulling each other up that small space in a capillary. The small bugs can stay on water surface without sinking, right? And that's because, so think about this, on water surface, the water molecules, uh, let me use a different color. So the water molecules kind of are sticky with one another, right? Because the positive end is attracted to the negative end and vice versa. So this forms this um, hydrogen bond, right? A weak force among the water molecules to kind of hold them together. So this is why water molecules are sticky to one another. So on the surface, you have these kind of water molecules all, you know, holding their hands together. So if you have a little bug, uh, you, you, you can't have something too heavy. Like when you step in water, you're not going to stay on the surface, right? You're going to sink. But for something that has a very small weight, like a little bug, the weight is just enough to kind of push down this layer a little bit without breaking it. So again, because the weight is very small, right? So you can see the bug kind of um, sinking down just a little bit, but it's not, the weight is not heavy enough to break this kind of water layer, right? So you can see the, the bug is almost like floating or walking on water surface. Next one, adhesion, water molecules. So adhesion is about different molecules that are sticky to one another. So in this case, we have water molecules 
We also have other types of molecules, for example, glass. And this is actually why we have meniscus, right? When you measure, say, volume of water or something else in a glass graduate cylinder, instead of having a straight line, when you put the solution there, you have a kind of concave line right there, right? And that's because the water molecules um, on the edge, they are attracted to glass molecules. So they are kind of uh, being pulled up a little bit. So this forms this kind of concave meniscus. When you read the solution volume, the liquid volume, you have to use the bottom line right there, right? So that's the correct reading for the volume of the solution. Okay, next one is a high specific heat capacity and a high heat of vaporization. And they're very, very similar. So this refers to the ability of water to hold a lot of the heat without changing temperature. I think we mentioned this before, right? When you heat water in a, um, say, a metal pot, the metal pot has a very low heat capacity. So with the same amount of heat, the metal pot is going to heat up very, very quickly, right? but it's going to take water a lot longer to heat up, right? Because the water, again, has that high heat capacity, right? So it can um, absorb a lot of heat without raising its temperature. High heat of vaporization, very, very similar, uh, but instead of temperature change, this is about vaporization, right? From liquid water to water vapor. When you heat up liquid water, it takes a lot of heat, right, for water to boil and becomes water vapor. So one thing you may need to remember is the temperature when water boils. So that's going to be 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. All right, next one, ice has a lower density than liquid water and thus floats. You probably all have this experience um, when you put a, a, a bottle of water in the freezer, uh, you know, after everything freezes, you take out the water bottle, you notice that ice inside has expanded, right? It's pushing the plastic material. Um, so that's because ice has a lower density than water. So with the same mass or weight or with the same amount of water, same amount or same weight or mass of water, lower density state, which is ice, is going to have a higher volume. So this leads to the expansion of ice, right, from the same amount of liquid water. Now, with that lower density, ice is lighter than liquid water. So ice is going to float on liquid water. And we know that this is kind of important in the nature, right? In the winter, ice floats on water and the forms kind of almost like an insulation layer to keep the liquid water temperature mild, right? Not too cold. So that the aquatic organisms living underneath the ice um, can still survive. Water is a universal solvent. Many substances dissolve in water. And that's kind of why we have um, water in our body, right? Because we are using a lot of, you know, different substances. We use electrolytes, we use sugars, we use proteins, and the water is this universal solvent that can dissolve most of them. So that's why, you know, it's, it's a really um, kind of advantage for our body to have water to kind of dissolve, to transport, to hold all those substances that are needed by our body. Okay. Number five, diffusion. So this is about the movement of molecules. Molecules have this tendency to diffuse through a permeable membrane or could be just air or a solid medium. So that's okay too. When you see a permeable membrane, this is more about diffusion in liquid. We often use this definition, that's because this is related to physiology um, in our body. So in our body, it's a watery environment. We're looking at the cells, right? 
And the cell membrane is a permeable membrane, but permeable uh, only to some substances, right? Not all the substances. But molecules tend to move from uh, an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. So if you have uh, two areas, higher, than, higher concentration, you can think of concentration as something similar to density, right? A high concentration area, meaning in the same uh, volume of liquid, you have a lot more of this molecule, right? So this will be, you know, let me draw the other one. So this will be high concentration, C-O-N-C -C stands for concentration, and this will be lower concentration. So when you have a two areas of different concentrations, then the molecules tend to move from this higher concentration area to this lower concentration area. Okay. So this phenomenon is known as diffusion. Now there are a lot of examples of diffusion. We see diffusion in liquid, diffusion in the air, and actually diffusion of different molecules in our body, right? Through the cell membrane, either in or out of the cell. Um, I want to have um, a very important example to kind of demonstrate diffusion. We touched on this before when we were in the respiratory system, right? We talk about the gas exchange. So what makes gas exchange at the lungs and at the tissue levels possible? That's diffusion. Diffusion of gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay. So think about the lungs. At the lungs, we have, um, at the end of the pathway, we have those alveoli, right? So alveoli are little kind of air sacs with a very thin membrane, right? So the, the air, these air sacs are made up of just one layer of cells in the wall. At the lungs, in these air sacs, in these alveoli, oxygen concentration is high, right? Carbon dioxide concentration is low because you're breathing in air, right? So that air is all fresh, high in oxygen, and very low in carbon dioxide. When the blood comes into alveoli, so this is a capillary which has blood, this blood has been circulated through your body and the blood has picked up carbon dioxide and drops oxygen at the tissues, right? So this blood has very high concentration of carbon dioxide, but low concentration of oxygen. So diffusion is going to happen because you have these different concentrations, right? Molecules will move if you have different concentrations. So the carbon dioxide is going to move from high concentration area to a lower concentration area. Carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out of the blood, cross the blood vessel wall, cross the wall of the alveolus, and diffuse into the alveolus, right, into the air sac. Oxygen is going to be the opposite. Oxygen is going to move from high concentration area, which is the alveolus, into the blood, right? From high to low. So in the end, the alveoli will collect carbon dioxide and delivers oxygen to blood. Now you're going to breathe out, you're going to exhale, right? When you exhale, you will get rid of carbon dioxide in the alveoli, which comes from the blood. And then you breathe in, it starts the cycle again. When you breathe in, uh, high in, the area is high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide. And then there is this kind of gas exchange. Right? Now, at the tissue level, it's the opposite, right? So tissue level, let me use a different color. At the tissue level, the blood is going to bring in oxygen. So oxygen is a high and carbon dioxide is low. And now you have cells. These are cells. So that's one cell. So for the cells, they're going to be 
high in carbon dioxide from you know uh, cellular respiration. Oxygen is low, right? The cell respiration utilizes oxygen and generates carbon dioxide. When the blood bring in the fresh blood, the oxygenated blood, the, the good blood into the tissues, there's going to be diffusion again, right? Oxygen is high in the blood, so it's going to diffuse into the cell, which has low concentration. Carbon dioxide is going to do the opposite, right? Carbon dioxide is high in the cell, so it's going to diffuse through the extracellular space and into the blood from high to low. So that's how gas exchange takes place at the tissues, at the lungs, right? And this allows the body to get rid of carbon dioxide and obtain oxygen for cellular respiration because your cells respirate every second, right? 24-7. So it constantly requires oxygen and also it needs to remove the carbon dioxide. So like I said, diffusion is so important, right? Without diffusion, there's no way that we can perform gas exchange and survive. Okay, osmosis. Now you can think of osmosis as a special type of diffusion. When we talk about diffusion, you remember I have a lot of examples with all kinds of things, uh, with sugar, with oxygen, carbon dioxide, and even lipid molecules, right? Or alcohol molecules. Diffusion really applies to pretty much all the molecules. Doesn't matter what molecules you're looking at. Protein molecules, carbohydrate molecules, carbon dioxide. Osmosis is only about the movement of water. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Movement of water also follows the principles of diffusion. So if you have a semi-permeable membrane separating two areas of solution, one with high concentration of water, and the other area has a lower concentration of water. Water is going to move, right, from high water concentration to low water concentration. It's just like diffusion of any molecules. They move from high concentration to lower concentration area. However, think about all the solutions you have seen uh, in daily life or, you know, in the lab. Have you seen anything that's labeled 50% water? So you have a, you know, a reagent bottle lying on the lab counter. Do you see that it's labeled 50% water or 75% of water? N not really, right? Because this kind of label does not tell you what's dissolved in that water solution. Basically, what the solution actually is, right? So when you label solutions, you don't indicate water concentrations, right? Instead, you need to indicate the concentration of the solute, right? What's actually dissolving water. So you would say, this is 50% sodium chloride solution, and this is 75% ammonium solution. I just want you to understand that when you solve real questions, real problems, nothing is labeled based on water concentration, right? That, that doesn't exist. Everything is labeled based on the solute concentration, the, the substance that dissolves in water. So these are the examples. And the solute concentration is inversely proportional to water concentration, right? If you have high water concentration, that means your solute concentration is going to be low, right? If you have more water, then you're going to have less solute and vice versa. If you have a low water concentration, then you're going to have high solute concentration. So it's the opposite, right? It's a inverse relationship. So now you can apply this to what we talked about before. So earlier, we said water molecules will move from high water Earlier, we said water molecules are going to move from high water to lower water concentration area. Now, high water is high water means it's low solute concentration, right? And the low water, that means it's high solute concentration. 
So when you convert water concentration to solute concentration, now water moves from low solute concentration area to a higher solute concentration area, right? So look at this picture. So we have uh, a beaker here, and the beaker is divided by this semi-permeable membrane in the middle. So this creates two different areas. The area on the left has a lot of salt molecules. All these black dots refer to salt molecules. All right, so you can see in the area on the right, this area right here, there are a lot of salt molecules, right? So in this case, the salt is the solute, right? Because these salt molecules are dissolving water. So this is going to be a high salt concentration area. And when you look at the, sec the half on the left, when you look at the, the left half, there is only water, right? There are no salt molecules. So this is going to be an extremely low, probably close to zero. So this is going to be a low salt concentration area. So based on what we know, water moves from low solute area or low salt area to high solute or high salt area. Right? So water is going to move from left to right. right? This is a low solute. This is a high solute. Again, water moves from low solute to high solute. Now, you're going to say, what if I don't use solute concentration? What if I use water uh, concentration to solve this problem? That works too. And you are going to get to the same conclusion. Let's do it together. Let me use a different color. Let's use green. So when you look at the left half, you see there is no solute molecule, right? It's all water. So this is going to be a very high water concentration area. So I, I skipped the concentration area. I'm just going to put high water. And when you look at your right half, there are more salt molecules in there. So that means it's going to have less water, right? So it's going to be low water concentration. So how does water move? If you use water concentration, water moves from high water to lower water concentration area, right? So still from the left to the right. So you can see both methods get you to the same conclusion, right? Next question. Human red blood cells are placed in a 10% sodium chloride solution. Which of the following correctly predicts what, di what direction? So I have a typo here. What direction water may flow? Okay, to, in order to answer this question, you need to know the concentration of sodium chloride in the cells. Now, usually these red blood cells will have a 0.9% sodium chloride. When you receive IV, a lot of times the drugs are dissolved in 0.9% sodium chloride solution. And that's because it's the same concentration for isotonic as the sodium chloride concentrations in human body fluid and human cells. So that's the concentration we use in IV. All right, so we know that these red blood cells, I'm going to draw one red blood cell. And the cell, inside the cell, the concentration of sodium chloride is 0.9%. All right, now we're going to put these cells in 10% sodium chloride, right? So the solution surrounding the cell has a higher salt concentration than inside the cell. So which direction would water go? In order to answer this question, you have to use your knowledge of osmosis, right? Osmosis. And that's because it asks you about the direction of a water flow. And osmosis is about the movement of water molecules specifically. All right, now we know in osmosis, water flow from high water concentration or low solute concentration to lower water concentration or higher solute concentration area. All right. 
So with that information, we can figure out that this is high solute or low water. Let me use different color so it's more obvious. 10% sodium chloride is going to be high solute. Then the 0.9% inside the cell, right? So this is a low solute. And if we convert that to water concentration, 10% sodium chloride will be low water, right? Because there's more sodium chloride molecules in the solution, so there's a less water, right? Lower concentration of water. Inside the cell, that's going to be high water, right? Because there's less sodium chloride. All right, now, with the information we have learned previously, we know that water flows from high, water concentration to lower water concentration or from lower solute to high solute concentration. So um, either one will give you the correct direction of the water flow, right? Water is going to exit the cell, move out of the cell and then move into the 10% sodium chloride. Okay, so which one is the correct answer? Water will move from its high concentration inside the cell to lower concentration outside the cell. So the correct answer is B. I have noticed that in the sample question, in the TEAS study menu, they actually use water concentration in the answer choices. So if you have been using solute concentration to solve osmosis problems, you need to be familiar with how to use water concentration to solve similar problems. Now, that's easy, right? Because if you just directly use water concentration, then it's always from higher water to lower water. So B should be pretty obvious, right? It, it's, so it's pretty obvious that B is the correct answer. A, water will move from its low concentration outside the cell. So that's correct, right? Outside the cell, it is the low concentration, but the direction is wrong, right? So water will move from from to lower concentration, right? Basically, um, once you correct A, the statement will become B, right? Which is the correct answer. C, water will remain in equal concentrations on both sides of the RBC membrane. That's not true, right? Because there is a concentration gradient or different concentrations on both sides of the membrane. Now, this net water movement across the membrane will be zero once the concentration is equal on both sides of the RBC membrane. For example, water is moving out of the cell into the, this 10% sodium chloride solution. So this concentration should go down, right? Because the water moving in is going to dilute this 10% sodium chloride. So 10% will go down. And the 0.9% will go up, right? Because there's less water now. So the concentration for sodium chloride will go up. Right? So eventually, you know, you will reach a point where the concentration, C, O, and C, will be the same, right? Inside the cell and outside the cell. So that's what we call equilibrium. This will help you understand why D is not the correct answer. Water will increase in concentration on both sides, that's not right, right? Water concentration will increase, increase outside the cell, right? And then decrease inside the cell. All right, so that's it. And then we're done with this lesson.